Hi there. Over the next few minutes, we're going to be looking at question types in learning catalytics. As a matter of fact, the variety of question types is one of the most popular features of learning catalytics. We've got a wide variety of question types to choose from, including composite sketch, confidence, data collection, direction, expression, highlighting, image upload, long answer, many choice, matching, multiple choice, numerical, priority, ranking, region, short answer, sketch, word cloud, and slide. So without further ado, why don't we go live into Learning Catalytics and take a look at these awesome question types. Let's dive right into a module and start looking at questions. We're going to go to edit this module. I could have made a brand new one from scratch, but we've already got one here, so I'll use that. We'll hit create new question. Let's start with composite sketch. Kind of quickly read through that. It says students sketch a graph using their mouse or by touching their screen. That, of course, depends on the device they're using. The results are displayed in a single composite sketch with each student's individual sketch overlaid semi-transparently on top of each other. This format works really well with large classes when you want to get an overall sense of the common theme among the sketches. Then it goes on to tell us for smaller classes or when you want to get a view of individual sketches in the class, you should try the regular sketch format question. Let's take a quick look at this. What we need to do is upload a background image. This could be any number of things. Uh, in this case, I'm going to put in a graph by dragging on to add images. I could also click the add images button and navigate to that. And now we need to type in our question. So for our question, Sarah walks to her friend Jay's house, which is seven blocks from home. This walk takes her eight minutes. She stays to visit for 10 minutes. And after her visit, she borrows a bike to ride home. The ride takes her four minutes. Please plot Sarah's trip on this graph. Now we've uploaded a graph image and the instructions tell us to drag that image into the prompt. So let's do that. And now I'm going to save this and preview. And this is what our students will see. Now they will trace out what they believe the answer is and save that. And the instructor will actually see an overlay. So let's look at a quick little preview of what results like this might look like. Now this is of course a sample. It's not my question, but you can see here that we actually see all of the students' impressions overlaid in a single image. Uh, this is great if you'd like to get a view of your student's general understanding of a question. Now this gives us a great example of how you might use this question type for a mathematical question. You could just as easily trace out a path on a map or perhaps trace the flow of blood through a heart image. Let's next consider the confidence type question. The description here says students distribute a fixed number of votes among the response choices. For example, students might place all of their votes on a response choice they're very confident of, or they might indicate uncertainty by spreading out their votes among several choices. You may select one or more answers to be counted as correct. By the way, none have to be correct here. And this says indicate opinion questions by not marking any answers as correct. So if you don't choose one or more as correct, this is purely an opinion question. So let's begin with a survey. Please select your favorite breakfast foods. And I'll type in some possible choices. And now we can determine how many votes the students have. Let's in this case say three. If you want, you can randomize the order of these. And now let's save and preview. Let's close this and see how this would look for a student. Let me go be a student by clicking student view. Pasting in the new session number and joining and now back over as an instructor. Let's actually deliver that question to my student. 
who has three possible votes. We're actually told at the top you got three possible votes to distribute amongst these choices. So let's go for maybe two votes towards bacon and one vote toward yogurt and submit my response. Now back over on the instructor side, we're seeing those come in. Please note, these are showing all as blue because we have this as an opinion piece. We don't have any correct answers selected. Our next question type is data collection, and probably the best way to explain this one is to describe my own use case. Uh, I teach microbiology lab, and at eight separate tables, I've got students doing research, and each of those eight groups needs to report their data to the class. Let's look at the description here. Respondents must report a numerical data point, and the results are displayed in a histogram with respective statistics, mean, standard deviation, etc. Use this question type where students are reporting numerical data that's the result of an experiment. Pretty much just like I described here. You can see that I've written in, please send the results of your disk diffusion experiment for tetracycline. Let's save that one and take a look at the student answering that question. Really quite simple from a student's viewpoint. All I've got to do is put in a numerical result. And on the instructor side, I see that result come in. Of course, I'm gathering from all of my students, so I should have the entire data set reported at that point. For our next question, let's take a look at direction. Now, this is an interesting question that can be simply direction or a vector. Uh, I've written out a question. Please drag an arrow indicating the direction of travel for the child at the top of the slide. I've also taken the trouble to upload an image here, uh, and my instructions are to grab that image and drag it into the question. And as you can see here, we have a child on top of the slide, and the question again is, what direction is the child likely to go? Now, if we look at the configuration for the question here, we're asked to left-click to place a red point where the vector starts, and right click to place a green point where the vector ends. As you can see here, we've got a red dot at the top of the slide, a green dot at the bottom. There's the beginning of our vectors, there's the end. Uh, we have a few other options here. We can anchor the arrow tail, we can anchor the arrow head, or we can choose to not anchor the arrow at all. That's my favorite option because it doesn't really give any indication to the student what should happen here. Uh, at the moment, this is scored based on direction only. This I would qualify as a direction question. If we choose to score based on direction and magnitude, we've now converted this to a vector type question. I'm going to go back to direction only. Uh, we have the ability to give a little bit of forgiveness. Uh, I've got this set for anything 20 degrees uh, from dead center on that vector should be right. If we're doing vector, we can also score the magnitude, and you can give some leeway there. I've got this set at 10 pixels. Let's now take a look at how this would work from the point of view of a student. A student's now presented with the image and is asked to draw an arrow. Now, keep in mind, I did not anchor the arrow in any way. I could have anchored the tail, but in many cases, that gives it away. So I can literally drag an arrow any direction I want. Let's start with the child and actually do what should be a correct answer. I'll submit that response. And over on the instructor side, I see a response. Let's zoom in on this. And you can see that we have a green arrow indicated that this is automatically graded. And in this case is correct. Let me go create a wrong answer now. And I'll move that arrow back up the slide. Also note that the arrow for the student is blue. Blue has no indication of right or wrong. And back over on the instructor side, this should update shortly. And you can see the arrow we have here is red. Uh, it's against that slide, so it's a little hard to see. But we can see the arrow head right there. So that response is graded as incorrect. That is the direction and also possibly vector question. For our next question type, let's look at expression. Now, as a life science guy, I'm going to admit mathematics is not my strong suit, but let's walk through this. Looking at the description, students enter a mathematical expression like, and we've got a couple of examples here, a computer algebra system automatically scores expressions as correct when they're algebraically equivalent to the correct answer you provide. In this example, X, Y, and Y, X are considered the same for 
pure numerical responses use the numerical question formats. We've already covered the numerical question. Now, as a non-math guy, I'm not going to try to write one of these, but I will take us to a great example from the question library. The question here is find the distance d between the points negative 2, 4 and 2, 10. Express the answer in fully simplified form. The answer here would be 2 square root of 13. And the suggestion here is for students to use the distance formula here. If we look to the right, we can actually from the library see historical performance of students with this question from the library. So that's a little handy. Next question type is highlighting, and this one I don't think gets nearly the attention it deserves. If we look at the description here, students highlight one or more words or phrases in a passage, and the results are displayed as a heat map. Take a look at a question in this format. The instructions identify the words in the following sentence that denote a neurotransmitter. And the passage my students are reading is right here. Upon arrival of the action potential at the axon terminal, voltage-gated calcium channels open. This frees up vesicles which migrate to the membrane and release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Let's see what a student does with that. Now my students are reading this particular passage, and if I've trained them right, they should want to highlight acetylcholine and submit their response. And back over on my side, I've got a heat map illustrating that. If another student picked another word, we would see other words highlighting as well. Notice the rest of the text is very pale, and acetylcholine is the darkest item there because that's the only item currently being selected. As more words were picked, they would show up as well, and the more popular the word, the darker it would be. Again, typical heat map. Here's another personal favorite, the image upload question. The description is actually quite simple and straightforward. Students upload an image from their computer or use their phone or mobile device to take a picture. So let's go with a popular favorite of mine. Please go to the lab, find an appropriate model, and take a close-up photo of a cerebellum, then upload that image for your answer. So on the student side, the instructions are pretty straightforward. They can upload a GIF, JPEG, PNG. They have the ability to choose a file, and they're off and running. So my student's going to click Choose File, pick the image they want, and over on my side, I'm starting to see thumbnail images come in. Our next question, long answer, is precisely what it sounds like. From the description, students enter free text in a large input box. I'm actually going to borrow a sample of this question type from the library for microbiology questions. And here's our example. The question, the atmosphere is approximately 79% nitrogen and only a few species of bacteria can use it directly as a nitrogen source. If all of these nitrogen-fixing bacteria on the planet were killed, what consequences would there be for life on the planet? And we've got a nice potential response from a student, something of this nature. Now, of course, you as an instructor are going to have to go in and place a grade on each response for this question type. Our next question is an old standby, many choice, which of course is a modified multiple choice. No surprises in our description. Students select zero, one, or many choices. You may select one or more answers to be counted as correct. Indicate opinion questions by not marking any questions as correct. And here by way of example, we're asking which of the following are fruits? And we've marked tomato, banana asparagus, broccoli, and cucumber, with tomato, banana, and cucumber being correct as fruits. Note that I've randomized these, and let's save that and see what it looks like for a student. And probably the biggest difference for a student between a many and a multiple choice is this nice little red comment here. You may select zero, one, or many answers. So let's presume that I have a student who's gone through this with me, and they know that the... Uh, Three selected here are correct answers. We'll submit that. And as an instructor, I'm going to see those answers come rolling in. Let's next consider an old standby question type, multiple choice. And here I'd actually like to show you one of my very favorite tricks. Lots of Pearson text come with clicker questions or something similar. These can be a great resource for writing questions in a hurry. So I've got that question copied. Let's just paste that 
into the question block. Let me next copy the answers. And I'll show you my very favorite trick here. We're going to select paste at once. And I'll hit uh, Command or Control V to paste all of those in. And notice it put each of those in their own question block. All I've got to do now is select the correct answer and save. I'm going to skip showing you what this looks like from the point of view of a student. I'm trusting that you can understand. Students are answering A, B, C, D, and it's very straightforward on your side. For our next question type, let's look at matching. The description tells us that students are presented with a set of sub-questions and a set of options and must select the appropriate option for each sub-question. Let's take a look at a sample from the question library for anatomy. In this example, we have four items, precentral gyrus, cerebellum, thalamus, and medulla. They're going to match to four possible options and they are lined up in the appropriate way. So let's add that one to our module and look at that from the point of view of a student. When the student sees this question, they see the possible options for answers. In this case, we have four possible answers, first choice, second choice, third, and fourth. And then the items to be matched, in this case, precentral gyrus of cerebrum, cerebellum, thalamus, and medulla oblongata. Let's take a quick look at this. Uh, first choice relay system for sensory input, that's the thalamus. So thalamus, I'm going to give first choice Balance and coordination, that's going to be cerebellum, that's second choice. Let me put that right there. Precentral gyrus of the cerebrum, that's going to be primary motor region. We'll put that as fourth choice. And that should leave third choice for the last matching item there. Uh, I'm actually going to change two of these. Let's swap the last two and get these wrong intentionally. So you can see what that looks like for the instructor. We'll submit those responses. Here in the instructor view, we see the answers coming into this matrix indicating every possible answer. And since we've only got one student responding here, we see the four answers from this student. Green obviously is correct. Red is incorrect. And what we don't see, but I'll bring in as an example now, is if we have multiple students delivering multiple answers, we're still going to see green and red, but we'll see varying opacities with paler indicating fewer responses and more dense indicating more responses. So you can see what the most popular right answers or most popular misconceptions might be. Our next question type is numerical, and let's take a look at the description. Respondents enter a numerical value in decimal, fraction, or scientific notation. You may optionally set a tolerance to accept a range of responses as correct. Example, the correct answer may be 4.23, but you may wish to accept any value between 4.2 and 4.3 is correct. So let's create a sample question here. Let's paste in the planet Neptune is 40 times farther away from the sun than the Earth is. The Earth receives blank times more energy from the sun than Neptune does. My answer here is 1600. And just to be fun, let's accept between 1500 and 1700 as acceptable answers. And it's always nice to put in an explanation for your students to see afterwards. So let's put in this. The energy follows the relationship of the distance squared. Since Earth is 40 times closer to the Sun, it receives 40 squared the energy Neptune does. We'll save that. Well, the student view of this question isn't particularly inspiring, but you can uh, watch me enter the answer here of 1600. And there's nothing especially surprising in the instructor's view of these answers coming in. Let's next consider the priority question. The official description, actually, I'm going to take issue with, and I'll tell you what I mean in a moment. Our official description says students prioritize the given choices and the results are summarized by showing the relative strength of preference of each choice. There is no correct answer. That last bit is what I would have an issue with. Let me show you what I mean. This can absolutely be used as a what is your preference kind of question but it's also really effective at putting 
in a particular order a series of steps. Let me show you what I mean. I've written a question, sort the components of a reflex arc into their proper order. Let's start putting in the options here. Let's begin with the receptor. Next I'll add sensory neuron. And when I enter the last, I'm going to check the box that says this question has a correct response reflected by the above ordering. Now my students must enter the items in that order in order to get the answer correct. Let's save this and take a look at this from a student's point of view. We see all of our choices as a student and we have up and or down buttons on each. So we need to move these in the appropriate spots. Keep in mind, the minute we touch one, it has been moved up or down. So if we want to chase those to the place we want them, we've done this right. I think I've got those in the order I want them. We'll submit those and see what my instructor sees. Next, let's take a look at a ranking question. The description is pretty straightforward. Students rank a list of items in order. Students may specify that several items on the list are equal. In essence, what's happening here is we have a series of items that have a relationship of being greater than, less than, or equal to other items in the list. So let me put in a nice example here. Without doing a calculation, rank these compounds from least to greatest molar solubility in water. Let's enter my first option, and the next, and the next. And now at the bottom, we need to establish what the right answer is. So we'll put in first, second, and third, because I did enter those in the correct order. And now we need to establish the relationship between each item in the list. The first is greater than the second, which is greater than the third. And that should have our question ready to go. Let's save it and look at it from the point of view of a student. So now my student in this particular case sees three possible choices, needs to select which goes where. We'll go with first choice, second choice, and third choice. That's how they happen to fall out in randomness and in the relationship. Greater, finally greater. Then we should be good to go. Let's take a look at what that looks like for the instructor. And now, as a life sciences professor, we come to what is probably my all-time favorite question, especially for teaching anatomy, the region question. As we look at the description, students click or touch their screen to indicate a point on an image. You draw a region on this image that defines what answer should be considered correct. So let me create what is probably my very favorite sample question for this. We've uploaded an image of a skull, and I've asked a student to touch or click on the temporal bone. And the really easy thing to do with this question is simply click dots to define a border around the area you're interested in. I will tell you, you're probably better having a relatively large target rather than a very small one. Very small targets can be hard for students to hit on mobile devices. And with that, we'll save that. And I want to point something else out to you. Here's another example of a region question. I've got a cartoon image of some zoo animals. I have drawn boundaries around all of the large cats in here. And the question was, please touch or click all of the large cats in this image. But note, I've got a checkbox here that says all regions are required for correctness. I could uncheck that and change this to a cat in this image. And now I've just defined four possible correct answers. If I want to go back to all the large cats, I can select all regions required for correctness. So you do have quite a bit of flexibility with the region question. Back over on the student side with our region question of the skull, our student is asked to touch or click on the temporal bone of the skull I'm going to misclick. Notice the student's dot that they leave is blue. Doesn't indicate right or wrong in any way. We'll submit that answer. And over on my instructor page, we'll see that answer come in. 
And as it does, that student got the answer wrong. Let me go back, change my response, and in this case, get it correct. And for the instructor, we're going to see a green dot arrive, and there it is. Now let's revisit an old favorite, which is far too often underappreciated, and that is the short answer question. Looking at the description, students enter free text in a small input box. There is a lot of power here to be considered whenever you realize you can actually have multiple correct answers. So let me show you what I mean. Which chamber receives blood returning to the heart from the body? Now the issue we have as instructors is there is one correct answer to this, but many ways for students to possibly write this. So let me step into a correct response here, and that is, of course, right atrium. But students might also write something like R atrium or R period atrium, and we can actually let them get away with that with a nice little computer coding trick. Take a look at a keyboard. Now look at the key directly above the return or enter key, and look at the shifted version of that. That character is called a pipe. And in computer coding language, that means OR. So I'm going to type right atrium pipe, which again is OR, and I'll do R atrium, and then pipe again, and R period atrium. I didn't have a space there, so let's do pipe again, and we'll do R period space atrium. So now, whichever variation of this my students type in, I don't have to bother going back to give them correct. Uh, scoring on this. The system will score any of these as correct answers. Now let's look at another favorite question type, the sketch. Let's take a look at the description which says students sketch a graph using their mouse or by touching their screens. Results are displayed as a tiled set of individual student sketches. Really that's thumbnails for each student. This format works better for a small class or when you want to be able to look at individual student sketches during the class. It goes on to say for larger classes, try the composite sketch format, which we have seen earlier in this video. Now let's draw one of my favorite question types. It's not based on a graph, but it's actually based on something I showed you earlier. Please sketch the flow of blood through the heart, beginning with the chamber which receives blood from the body. Once again, I'll drag an image from my computer onto the Add Images button. I could also, as I indicated before, click the Add Images button and navigate. And now what I would like to do is simply drag that picture, following the instructions, into the question, and we're good to go. So let me save this and let's see that as a student. Now here as a student, I'm asked to trace my sketch, so let me do that and submit my response, which then shows up for my instructor. Now, if I had 30 students in this class, I would actually see 30 separate thumbnails, and I can hover over any one of these for an expanded view. Please note, as I do that, it does not identify the student who answered this, so I could absolutely bring this up as an example of a correct answer for my students. Now let's take a look at a little gem of a question that's not truly a question. It's more of a survey tool, and that would be word cloud. From the description, students enter free text in a small input box, and the results are displayed to the instructor in a word cloud. From personal experience, I'll tell you you're going to get better results if your students actually enter a single word. So let me give you one of my very favorite questions for a word cloud. Please, in a single word, tell me what most confused you about last week's lecture. And when your students reply, you'll see their words coming at you in this sort of format, giving you an idea of what sort of questions, concerns, or opinions your students have. The last question type truly isn't a question type. It is actually a slide item where you can upload your PowerPoint slides and then scroll through them for your students. What we need to do is click the button to import a PowerPoint deck. Select the deck you want to import. And give that a moment to finish uploading. And then save your slide deck.
Once you have your slide deck ready, all you have to do is deliver to students. They will see the slide you currently have presented. Then you simply scroll down to the next slide to move them along. You can continue on to whichever slide you'd like them to see. And of course, you can go backward as well. So what you actually have here is a really robust tool during the pandemic to send slides to whatever device your students might have. This has been a tour of the question types available for learning catalytics. I hope you found something helpful here.